Okay, we're going to read in the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, chapter number 8, and we're going to read at verse number 6. Let's stand together. It is our, our habit of honoring the Word of the Lord. Um, let me ask the display. Uh, can you guys give me this scripture in the New Living Translation? Do you have the NLT uh, version? Um, if you do, then give me uh, Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse number 6 in the NLT. If not, we'll just read it in the New King James Version. Uh, I will give you a second to explore that. Um, I am preaching today from this theme. First love is a fire. First love is a is a fire. Uh, any luck on the translation? Or if there's any problem, just give it to me in uh, uh, King James or New King James. James. All right, so we're going to read this verse number eight, uh, excuse me, verse number uh, six. Verse number eight starts getting weird, and so we'll move along. Uh, verse number six, set me as a seal. Somebody say a seal. seal. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, of a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. First love is a fire. Smile at somebody, say, I don't know if this message is for you or not, but I'm thinking it probably is. <laughs> Amen. So uh, I, I'll start by admitting what you already know. And that is this, um, uh, not a lot of sermons preached from the Song of Solomon. Um, Song of Solomon is uh, one of the most contested books in all the history of the, the canonical scripture or the canon, the formal 66 books that make up uh, what we know of as the Bible, the Holy Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, the Song of Songs, or as we more formally call it, the Song of Solomon, um, is perhaps the most contested book in all of the Old Testament. The rabbis used to say, uh, when they were criticizing it, the group that was saying it should not be included because of its, of its um, nature, its romantic manic love style and nature, they would always say um, it's, it's very hard to keep clean hands when you uh, read the, the Song of Songs. And the other side of the argument would, would say, no, no, that's just you guys that are having problem with that. Uh, this example of romantic love is a scriptural and spiritual teaching to us. And uh, finally, uh, I won't get into all the, 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 the history of it, but finally, one of the most famous rabbis came. Uh, Came out and 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 formally declared uh, that it was it was a, a spiritual instruction to us, and that the Lord was intentionally teaching us through uh, romantic love, or what what the the Greeks would call eros, romantic love. Um, now we are all of us going to church and being Christians, or at least the best of our ability. We all of us are trying. Uh, to be like the Lord, and we want to be filled with his love and filled with his heart. And, and God's love, we understand it in the New Testament as agape love. You've, you've probably heard that a lot, agape love. Uh, that is, that is uh, divine love. It's unconditional love. Now, let me point out something here you probably already suspect, but I want to, I want to kind of establish it. Um, we are all of us limited, finite, uh, willful humans. Can I have a big amen? Amen. Um, none of us have ever experienced, uh, in a human context, we've never experienced uh, unconditional love. The closest that the human experience brings you to unconditional love would be, uh, I think we all could agree that it would be a mother's love for a child. Um, that That is an uh, image shown to us in some of the poetic uh, scriptures in the Bible. Um, that's probably as close as we get to understanding 
um, this idea of agape love. We, we do not understand agape love because we are not God. Um, we cannot love unconditionally. Um, you know, however much you love that little baby, um, they, they're going to grow up and turn into a teenager. And then as a fine young barbarian, they're going to drive you crazy. And uh, that's how that works. And there's really no getting around it. And it'd be great if uh, we could say, oh, we have agape love. But here's the problem. Um, the reason why we fail at having agape love is uh, uh, we don't love as we should. We love as we are. Uh, we are always changing. Uh, we, we, we love as we are. If you're hurting, you will still love, but your pain will infringe upon your love. Like it or not, lie about it or not, if you are suffering, that influences your love. You are always changing, and your love is always changing. One of the things we read again and again uh, in the Scripture, Old Testament to New, is this, this challenge to renew our hearts and read us discover first love. It's not just a beginning of the book of Revelations principle. It's even in the Psalms. It's even, it's even before then where the writers are talking about zeal for the Lord and, and loving the things of God and, and loving the, 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 the purposes and the principles and the presence of God. Uh, the Lord loved Jacob, but he hated Esau because Esau did not have a heart for the things of God. And, and Jacob did have a heart for the things of God. And, and we see this over and over and we all of us know how difficult it is for us to maintain first love. Why is that hard? Because you are always changing. And you love where you are, not where you wish you were. You love where you are. And so, and I mean that in the sense your love is limited by where you are, what's going on in your life. And so uh, God does not change. Hear me, stay with me a couple minutes here while we get some foundations in place. God does not change. Let me say it again. Maybe I'll get an amen on this side of the church. God does not change. God does not change. God, ooh, y'all need to, we need to have a Bible study on how God does not change. Somebody say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can I have an amen? amen. I'm going to try y'all. He's the same yesterday. yesterday. Oh, Lord, we need a move of the spirit over here. I'm going to have to get the heels starting back there, anointing people with oil, working the way up here to the front, this section right here. God doesn't change. God's love does not grow cold. He doesn't change. Our love grows cold because we change. That first year you get married, uh-huh, yeah, enough said. <laughs> Fresh love is fire. But we cool with the passing of the years and things get complicated. I, this morning in the 9 a.m. service, I told a Boudreaux joke in honor of my wife. Uh, she's a Cajun. She's, she's from uh, Louisiana. And um, I tried to do the whole Boudreaux accent and everything, and it was a bit of a failure. And um, she shook her head in that dismissive, non-first love manner. If I had told that joke that first year of the marriage, she'd be like, oh, baby, you're so fine. <laughs> and now she's like, oh, God, really? Did I just suffer through that? See, uh, uh, Boudreaux, Boudreaux's driving. This is a Boudreaux joke, but I'm not going to try to do the accent unless the spirit moves me. So uh, he's driving, and uh, the, the local police officer pulls in behind him and hits his lights because he was speeding. Well, Boudreaux didn't want to pull over, you know, because he was he, he figured he, he had already been, had too many tickets, so he pushed on that accelerator and started driving faster and driving faster and driving faster, got up over 100 miles an hour, and he realized he wasn't going to, to get, uh, shake off the police officer, and so he finally pulled over, and the police officer came up there and said, Boudreaux, you give me one good it's been a long day Boudreaux you're giving me trouble you give me one good reason why I shouldn't write you a ticket and I'll let you go this time and Boudreaux thought for a minute he said well officer last week my wife ran off with a cop and I thought it was you and you were trying to give her back to me <laughs> You see, that first year of marriage, it wasn't like that. That first year of marriage, it was all strawberries and kisses and all Hershey's chocolates and flirting. And uh, But the thing is, we're changing. We're not God. We're always changing. And the, the trouble comes. This is what I want to say to all you spouses. Let me give you a 30-second a marriage seminar, which we need to have one of those, by the way. Try to get my wife prayed through. But we're going to have one of these for 30 seconds. If you want to stay in love, you're going to have to work at it. You are always changing. You are complicated. Your life is going 
going up and down and sometimes you're crazy and sometimes you're less crazy. You're always a little bit crazy and your life is always to the right, to the left, and the left, and the right. If you want to stay in love, you better work at it. And if you don't work at it, you ain't going to stay in love. This ain't rocket science. If you'd like to write that down, it's for you. The grass isn't greener on the other side. It's green on, greener on whichever side you water it. Amen. Deep thoughts with Pastor Nate. Okay, so you are always changing. You have to renew your love. You have to renew your wife. All, all you wives, slap your husband and say, that part was for you, honey. Tell him, tell him, slap him good. So you have permission. That's a, that, you have to renew your love. You are changing. This is what I want you to see, though. God is not has no need to, review, to renew his love. He loves you just as much today as the day he formed you. He loves you just as much today as when... When you were formed in your mother's womb. He loves you just as much today as the first time you lifted your hands as a child and saying, yes, Jesus loves me. He loves you just as much today as the first time you came to an altar. God doesn't need to renew his love. He never changes. But there is nothing we can learn about ourselves through that understanding because we are always changing. And so the wise man is going to teach you something about love, not with the language of agape love, which you can only admire but never understand. He's going to teach you something about love with eros language, romantic love, because that is something you understand. And in the same manner that the lessons of eros teach us something about the spiritual, the lessons of eros make us all a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, if you ever been around people who are newly in love, they just make you want to slap them. <laughs> you hang up first. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. Stop flirting with me. <laughs> no, you hang up first. I'm just going to sit here. I'm not hanging up. It's because I love you more. I love you more. No. <laughs> You know I love you more. You almost forgot my birthday. <laughs> you did. That proves I love you more. Yeah. But I bought you a better present. Ooh. We got to go. It's so late. I have to get up at 6 in the morning. Well, what time is it? 4.30. <laughs> I'm not going first. I love you more. Oh, baby, I wish I was with you. Oh. What are you wearing? <laughs> okay, I'm stopping right there. That was funny. I don't care what y'all say. Why are you uncomfortable? Solomon doesn't care you're uncomfortable. He's going to bang you over the head with it. Love, 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 love. Ooh, darling, look at you. Mmm, you're so fine. You blow my mind. Why are we uncomfortable? Because after a few years, we're all a bunch of closet Puritans. And you get around newlyweds, and they're like, no, you hang it first. You hang it first. You hang it. And you're like, oh, my God, just get a room already. <laughs> That's why Song of Songs almost didn't make it into the canon. Because generation after generation after generation of religious folks, somebody say, That's me, was made awkward by it. And it almost didn't make it in. It is the most contested book. Hear me today. And yet God chose romantic love to teach us something about a spiritual relationship. I want you all to know that it is ever so important that our love for God be something we fight for, something we are committed to, something that we are resolute about, something that we 
commit ourselves so strongly to that it is not fragile love. God, save us from fragile love. We want the kind of love that is seared upon our soul. That's the language the poet right, the, the poet uses, the, the wise man chooses. Your love is seared upon my soul as though I am branded by your love. It's like a seal on my heart. You can put a brand of your love on my arm because love, our our love is as strong as death. And I'm jealous for you. That's what he's saying. I'm jealous for you. And, and this love is to the death. And this love is, it's, 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 it's going to outlast the grave. I'm so jealous for you. I don't want someone else to get your time. I don't want someone else to get your affection. I don't want you to chase after foreign gods and idols. I stink and love you. And I'm serious about it. And it's not fragile. And it's not here today and gone tomorrow. And it's not whimsical teenage love. It is strong, sturdy love. And it burns like fire in me. I'm just thinking nuts about you. I love you. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. It is how God wants you to understand how committed he is to you. It burns like a fire and water tries to quench it, but rivers can't put it out. God loves you. And the rivers of struggle and strife come against it. And the kings of this world and the emperors have warred against this divine love, but it will not go out. God loves you. He's nuts about you. It's our love that goes up and down. It's not God's love. I said it's our love that's in and out, not God's love. It's our love that's flaky and uncertain and distracted. Come on down. Not God's love. God's love is anti-fragile. It is sturdy love. And so it is that we strive to maintain our love for God because we've seen how much he loves us and the writers appeal to us and say you know he first loved you when you were dead and trespasses and sin he loved you and that 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 somehow uh, uh, reminds us of how we should we should love God and we and we stir ourselves and then you know the middle years of serving God where you don't want to be troubled you know you, you want the church to have volunteers but you want to kind of hang back and see if someone else is going to fill that role of volunteering but when you there was a day you weren't like that there was a day I wasn't like that we were hungry to show our love for God and so it is that we we are challenged and we are we are willing by the presence of God. Uh, when, we, when we feel far away from God, we, we have to be reminded that it wasn't God who moved away from us. It was us who moved away from away from God, and God loves us. We all of us, we all of us have to understand God's love, even though we have never felt it in our own possession. We have only observed it as the mark of divinity. That's why agape love, unconditional. It's the mark of divinity. All of our love down here is conditional. Your parents almost love you unconditionally, but you act crazy enough and see if it doesn't affect things. Your husband, your wife almost loves you unconditionally, minus one, but you act out and act crazy and see how that unconditional love works for you. We don't get that. That's a God thing. It's the mark and the stamp of divinity. We can learn from arrows, however, because all of us know what it is to be in love, to be absolutely in love, desiring, longing, and hungry for that special someone in our life. That's the, that's the goal for all of us to live that way. I, I love the story. I love the story of the famous uh, hymn writer, uh, Fanny Crosby, who she wrote, you know, she was born blind. She lived uh, 1820, I think, to 1915, something like that. Uh, she, she, she was born blind, never saw at all. And yet she wrote
wrote over 8,000 hymns expressing her love for God. Think about that. Here's someone who has a reason to perhaps feel like they were given an unfair uh, hand uh, dealing of life's cards. They had, she had every reason to be a little bit self-centered, a little bit uh, feel sorry for herself, and instead she took the darkness of her life and turned it into 8,000 hymns expressing love to God. She wrote glory to God. Hallelujah. She wrote, he hideth my soul. She wrote, I am thine, O Lord. She wrote, Jesus is passing this way. She wrote, my Savior first of all. She wrote, near the cross. She wrote, pass me not, O gentle Savior. She wrote, redeemed and how I love to proclaim it. She wrote, showers of blessing. She wrote, to God be the glory. She wrote, blessed assurance. She knew the power of love. And so the wise man says, look at this kind of love. Look at Eros. Look at the love between lovers and see how much that God loves you. See how much God is committed to you. And understand how you are the one who is changing, not God. And this love is a commitment. It's a seal. It's a fire. First love is a fire. If we're not careful, first love fades and it turns into something less than a fire. And if we're not careful, it fades into a smolder. And if we're not careful, it, 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 it fades into just the dimmest of coals. And if we're not careful, we go back into the presence of God. But there's no fire of love within us. There is only a smoking memory of what we used to feel. How did it happen? Well, we never stopped changing. We never stopped going through struggles. We never stopped being affected by things. We never stopped. We never stopped. Life came at us every day, all day long. I cannot tell you today, unfortunately, I cannot tell you uh, how, to, how to maintain uh, in some perfect way uh, your first love. That's, a, that, that's very much uh, reflective of your life and where you are. I've seen Christians go through terrible things, and I've seen them fight for their love for the things of God. Uh, I, I've seen uh, Christians go through all the great sufferings of life. Uh, the most difficult probably would be a loss of a child. I, I've seen Christians go through that. We've seen our own uh, beloved brothers and sisters go through that. Uh, we've seen loss of spouse. Uh, we, we've seen loss of friends. We've seen disease and sickness and illness. Uh, we've lost people we love very much. Uh, we buried my grandmother this year. Uh, we miss her. Uh, so many people that we, we, we know what it is to lose. and We know what it is to have the cooling effect of loss on our life. Uh, if you've gone through lots of pain in your life, it will, it will affect you. Pain will, uh, it will morph you in negative ways. It will make you harder than you really are. It will make you shorter tempered than you really want to be because pain has in some way uh, molded you in a negative manner. If you go through great loss, you're going to struggle to keep that first love. Uh, and you are going to have to choose to fight for it. You're going to have to choose to hold it dear to your heart. God's not the one who needs a renewal. We are the ones who need renewal. Um, if, if you go through trials in your church, um, you're going to have specific pains that come to you uh, directly as a result of the things that you, you go through in your own, your own life and your own circumstance. Um, I've, I've known a lot of Christians who um, they loved God, but they, 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 they had met God's people and they didn't want anything else to do with church. I would say most people who are currently not in church, uh, but grew up in church, it's not God they're mad at, it's God's people they're mad at. Um, you're going to have to have a love that recovers from the wounds of misunderstanding. You're going to have to find a way to renew your first love after you've been misunderstood. Let me, let me just point out a few things here. You already know this, but it'll be good for all of us to be reminded. If you do anything for God, you'll be criticized. Anything. Anything. It, it can be small. It can be large. You're going to be criticized. If it's a success, you're going to be criticized by people who are jealous. If it's a failure, you're going to be criticized by people who uh, they, they 
they, they're criticizing your failure. You know this. This isn't rocket science. If you don't want to be criticized, don't do anything. Don't try anything. Don't be anything. Just, just hide in a little foxhole and, and, and that'd be the end of your story. But if you try to do anything, if you try to lead a ministry, you're going to be criticized. There'll be people who like the way you do it, people who don't like the way you do it. I've had the unique opportunity in my life of being accused of two opposite things in the same week. Uh, you think I'm making a joke. I am not making a joke. Here recently, I was accused of two opposite things. One person said I was too far this way. The other person said I was too far this way. The same subject in the same week. And when it happened, I just called my wife. I said, honey, this is the Lord encouraging me because I've been accused of two opposite things in one week. You have to commit your love, your first love to Almighty God. You have to have Jesus Christ in the forefront of your life and you have to renew that. Otherwise, the first time you're wounded in the church will be the end of your ability to be used of God in his body. The first time you're misunderstood, the first time somebody makes fun of you, the first time somebody uh, in some way wounds you, you'll be done with the body of Christ and you will be casting away your own spiritual effectiveness because God designed you to be a part of a body. And someone in that body will not understand that you're different than them and it's okay. The hand will look at the eye and say, you guys are so sensitive, you make me sick. What if I walked around like that? What if every time I picked up something, I said, oh, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And the guy will say to the hand, well, you're just a tool. You're, you don't have any understanding. You're just a tool. And you'll say, I can't be here anymore. I've got to leave. You will have to renew your love for God. But God does not have to renew his love for you. So we, all of us must learn how to get back to first principles and say, I am going to serve God. I'm going to love God. I'm not looking to the left. I'm not looking to the right. I am renewing my first love. And if you don't know how to do that, you're always not going to be fighting for more than just your love. You're going to be fighting for your soul. If you won't fight for your love, you'll soon be fighting for your soul. And so again and again in the scripture, you see this call to renewal, to, to first love. I can't tell you how some formula whereby you keep your first love uh, where it's supposed to be and keep the flames of divine uh, of affection and charity and devotion uh, burning brightly. But I, I can tell you a little bit about how a fire stays burning. And so maybe you can learn something from the illustrations of the fire. Fire has to have three things to continue burning. It has to have heat, Number one, it has to have uh, fuel. Number two, and it has to have, what's number three? I forgot, oxygen. Three things you got to have to have a fire going. Uh, heat is the uh, most difficult for us to understand because a lot of times we don't understand the mechanics of a fire. But when you put water on a fire, uh, you're, you're cooling the fire. And that's why uh, firemen are trained to spray water into a fire in a certain way. They literally are cooling the fire because if they don't cool it, even if they put the flame out, anything that is against the heat will burst into flame. That is why a bed of coals can have no flames visible. But if you lay fuel on it, it bursts into flame. There's so much heat there. And so you have to have heat. Secondly, secondly, you have to have oxygen. Oxygen, uh, a lot of modern firefighting technology is not about cooling the fire with water, but it's about robbing the fire of oxygen. That's why a lot of the modern um, uh, uh, fire extinguishers, they put a gas over the fire that sucks the oxygen from it. And without oxygen, the fire goes out. And then finally, is the fuel. When the fire runs out of fuel, it disseminates and it is in the, what can we learn? What, what can we learn from this? First of all, heat that was easy in the beginning. That was easy in the beginning, but you have to keep the heat in your devotion toward the Lord. And you're going to do that by what you focus your attention on. Hear me today, my, my brothers and sisters, you need to every day give credit to God for everything he has done for you. Don't get into this habit of what have you done for me lately. If God never does anything else for us, we owe him an eternity of worship. 
an eternity of devotion, an eternity of uh, uh, exaltation. God's done so much for you. You need to cultivate that in your heart. You need to look again at what God has done to you for you. You need to look again at his great love for you. You need to keep it in the forefront of your mind. This is why you will be changed by what you focus on. That's why the Lord tells the prophet Habakkuk, he tells him this. He says, write down the vision. He doesn't say write down the problem. He says, write down the vision. When you sit up all night worrying, you know what you're doing? You're repeating the problem over and over and over. So let me ask you this question. When's the last time you stayed up all night long repeating the vision all night long? God's going to do it. There's going to be an outpouring. There's going to be a rain from heaven. God's going to stir this nation. There's going to be a great revival. Oh, what are you doing? I'm repeating the vision all night long. That's not what we do. We repeat the problem all night long. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have enough money. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go out in the garden and eat worms. You repeat the problem all night long, all night, and then wonder why it changes you. Your heat will be managed by what you're focusing on. And so you need to be a one-man band of what God has done for you. You need to be a one-man praise leader. Now, I know you can't sing as as good as I can, but you need to have a one-man band praise linger, and you need to learn how to lead your own choir. It's an invisible choir, but you need to learn how to get up and say, God's been so good to me, I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. He's done so much for me, I cannot tell it all. What are you doing? I'm keeping the fire hot. (laughs) Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the... Praise him in the rising of the sun. Praise him to the going down of the same. The name of the Lord shall be praised. Early in the morning I sought you. I'm keeping the fire hot. That's number one. Real quick, I'm almost done. That's number one. Number two. Oxygen is environment. If you have an environment full of the things of the world... Your fire is going to go out. If you fill your life with a bunch of Hollywood philosophy and carnal pursuits and sinful distractions, your fire is going to go out. God's not going to change. You are going to change. Your environment is going to have sucked the fire out. The, 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 The fire extinguisher takes the oxygen from the fire and the flames cannot burn so what are we focusing on that keeps the heat where it should be how are we handling our environment that lets the fire for the love of God to burn thirdly fuel you are the fuel of transformation fuel is that object which when in fire is transformed from one state to another and releases the heat of its transformation. You are the fuel. You are the fuel. God is changing you. And every day he's making you more like unto him. That affects every element of our life. That affects the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we live. It affects what we listen to. Come on, somebody give me a big amen on that. If you're listening to stuff that's putting the fire out, honey, it's you who are changing, not God. He's just as crazy about you as the day he formed you. He's crazy jealous for you. What are we focusing on? What kind of an environment are we accepting? And are we being transformed into what he has called us to be? Transformation in God is always purposeful. We become the clay upon his potter's will. And he molds us and makes us into what we ought to be. And your creation is purposeful. He has a plan for you. He has a work for you to do. He has a witness for you to give. He has a renewing. The old you is being put away and the new you is being taken upon. The transformation is purposeful. It is intentional. And out of that transformation is going to come glory to his name name and purpose for the calling for which he has called you. First love is a fire, but we're always changing. 
And the only way we get back to first love is when we recognize God's not the one who needs to change. We are the ones who need to get back to where we once were in God. Can you receive that today? Let's all stand. Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte. If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, worship with us at 4929 North Sharon Amity Road. For information about service times, church ministries, and so much more, visit us online at firstchurchclt.com. If you would like to support our efforts, text GIVE to 704-445-5353. We pray God's richest blessings to you. Come, worship with us.